I'm ready. Good. Well, welcome everybody to the famous Los Angeles Adventurers Club for another wonderful uh, evening and lecture. We have over here to my left the fabulous Wayne White. Fabulous. <laughs> I was going to introduce him as we now get to go to see Wayne's World. For some of you, remember that movie? But Wayne um, is quite a guy. He sort of walked the walk and talked the talk. Um, he's been in the roughest jungles of the world in Papua New Guinea and Erie and Jaya. And he's also spent three winters in Antarctica, which is where his mustache turned white. <laughs> you could see the picture, I think, in his picture when he was young in Papua New Guinea. He was he had dark brown hair, but not anymore. However, Let's get started with Wayne and his adventures in Papua New Guinea, which uh, are really amazing. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thanks very much. And I want to, uh, I'm Wayne White, member 1194, and I've been told to make this thing look at, I'm supposed to look at you most of the time, but I have a hard time not looking at the audience. Uh, first thing I've got to do is uh, apologize. Uh, to wear a hat indoors is, is not really proper, but um, I was in the shower at the hotel, and I, it's a conditioner. You know a conditioner? I don't know what that shit is, but anyway, I put it in my hair. It's like this white, goopy stuff, so my hair went everywhere, and I had to put this stuff, so the, at least it's kind of keeping my hair together, so I'll break some uh, break some fashion rules here, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really great to be here tonight and I'm discussing something different than I usually do. The last few things have been about my South Pole experience, which I'll briefly, I'll briefly mention. Now folks, uh, what's interesting about what I'm going to do tonight with these two trips are both to Papua New Guinea. I made a total of six trips uh, in, in all. I, I've got a lot of slides, so I'm going to go real fast through some of these things. You're going to see they're just scenery shots, and I'm going to be moving fast. I'm going to have to to get this thing staying on track. Um, and also, it's good to know that, uh, that the uh, um, well, it's, it's good to know that, you know, they, I should get the, the message across doing that. But the one thing I wanted to mention was to do this presentation tonight, it wasn't quite as ad lib as it is with anything I do on Antarctica because it was so long ago. This first trip you're going to hear about was 1982. I have logs from that time that I haven't looked at in all those years. I looked at them just the last two days. And uh, it's very interesting to, to, to see what, uh, you know, what I thought when I was a younger man. Uh, kind of interesting to go back. Um, a little bit about me, that's, that's enough. I've been around uh, Marine for many years ago. Um, we worked, that picture was with General Petraeus in Iraq as a contractor. And then the last thing, it's important, is my book. Cold Three Winters at the South Pole, which is available online. I mean, it's not. It's uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, anywhere you can find Cold Three Winters at the South Pole, and uh, it's, it talks about my my uh, experience as a winter manager at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. I think most people that have read it have enjoyed it. Um, but tonight, for tonight, the thing is, it's not about that. Tonight, when I, for these trips, I hadn't done any of those things. The only thing I had done was I lived in California at the time. I was uh, been out of the Marines, finished a couple years of college. I was in a reserve, Army Reserve Unit, a, a Charlie Company, 12th Special Forces Group that was out of uh, Van Diemen Hall in San Diego. And um, I hadn't done all those cool things in life. So this was kind of the first cool adventure that I did all those years ago. All right. Why did I go? There you go. Now, in the days when I was a kid, um, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have all these great programs you have now. Uh, we relied on other things, like these old magazines, you know, these, uh, these, these incredible magazines and some of the books that were out. But the main reason I wanted to go to New Guinea was it was the goddamnedest wildest place I could think of. I did research on it, and, um, and I knew it was the wildest place that I could possibly go to. Now, let's see. Oh, I don't have the screen to point at. Okay, it doesn't matter. That's really the whole reason I brought this thing. All right. This is not from New Guinea. It's actually from Africa. But I think what I'll do is, I think what I'll do is... You might be walking off camera there. That's all right. Just look at this. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you guys can see me. That's what matters. And all you people out in TV land or whatever it is. Uh, you know. All right. This is important because this kind of gives you the background. New Guinea, second largest island in the world. It's a big damn island. Um, it's a, it's a, a, a place that is, is been kind of uh, very mysterious. Uh, the history of New Guinea and, and uh, the mariners that would wash up on the shore and end up getting eaten or whatever by the, the locals, was uh, it was considered quite a... 
quite a rough place. Uh, crocodiles, poisonous snakes, high mountains, people that uh, at one time ate people, tribal wars, everything that I wanted to see <laughs> as a young man. And, um, and so my first trip uh, was down through Port Moresby and then next, uh, the, the Kokoda Track, a famous wartime, wartime trail that runs through the mountain for about 50 miles. Next. All right. Um, any Australians? Anybody from Australia? All right. In Australia, in Australia, the Australians are very proud of their of the, this Kokoda campaign that occurred all those years ago. Very, very proud. Terrible thing. The Japanese, I was going to point out, it doesn't matter. The Japanese... Excuse me, Wayne? Yeah. Explain what the Kokoda Trail is and when it was. Yes. In 1942, early 1942, the Japanese wanted to... Um, they wanted to, they would love to have invaded Australia, but they couldn't do that, but they could control a lot of what was happening in Australia if they could gain a foothold on that lower part of New Guinea, which is, you know, north of Australia. They tried a sea attack to go around, and that didn't really work, so they decided that they would march over the Owen Stanley Range and take Port Moresby, the capital city. And this, this photo, photo here shows some of the Australians that ended up fighting in that campaign. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail on it, but there's all kinds of great information online if you want to read about the Kokoda Trail, the battles, and how vicious and horrible it was. Probably more people died from the disease and the other things that were that, that, that they faced than even the uh, than even the, uh, uh, the the combat. But it was vicious, vicious combat. The Japanese at one point overran their supply lines, and the Australians found when they captured captured later some of the Japanese emplacements, evidence of cannibalism, where the Japanese had been eating their own people and also some of the Australians, which later after the war they tried to go to a war crimes thing, but there were bigger war crimes to take care of than that. Nonetheless, we're talking about a vicious, vicious place um, with uh, all kinds of hazards. And the Australians... Um, finally prevailed uh, at the very end of 1942, but that's what drew me. So I'm in, I'm in, uh, in uh, New Guinea, and there you can see on the map the old wartime trail, which I ended up walking from uh, Port Moresby up, up north through those, er through those villages that you see all the way to Papandetta, Kokoda, and Papandetta on the other side. Um, next, this shows the elevation. Now the elevation is up and down, up and down, up and down. They, uh, um, it is a difficult trail. And when I did it in 82, um, I was told I'd never make it. Back then, the trail was overgrown. There was nothing there. Uh, now tourists go. They, had, they take tour groups through there. And um, they probably mowed it and stuff. But still, anyone there would have to walk the damn thing. But nonetheless, it's a different day. 1982, um, it was, a, it was um, very, very overgrown. And, and you'll kind of see that. But it's an up and down thing, which you'll get to see. So I arrive in Port Moresby next. I stay at the Papua Hotel. Uh, Port Moresby, who's been to Port Moresby? That's a rough place now. In 1982, it wasn't any better. And I, I looked at, the interesting thing was going through my, my, my logs, which I called logs, but they ended up being more of a diary than I really suspected. And I had comments in there like, I went by a bar, it looked like a real hell hole, so I went in. <laughs> Young man, you know, so, it, uh, so, so, so it's funny getting to read those things so many years later. Anyway, Port Moresby was a tough place back then, very violent place. Next, from Port Moresby, then I took a, probably a truck, I think, up, up to the start of the, the Kokoda Trail, and you get to start to see the, the scenery of New Guinea, which, um, you know, I'm kind of blasting through this, but it's just the luscious, most tropical place you can imagine with rivers and streams, and then, of course, the things that go with that, mosquitoes, leeches, crocodiles, and some really wild people, too. The start of the trail there, Oars, Oars Corner, um, an old, uh, a, uh, a plaque commemorating that particular area. Um, next. Okay. Um, one of the streams. And then this is kind of important. The Red Shield Center, these are missionaries. This was my first, my first, uh, my first time I'd experienced missionaries. And these people were tough people. This guy, Ken, at the Red Shield Center had hiked the Kokoda Track himself. He was a tough Australian. And they lived a life that was um, very, very rough. They, uh, I had dinner with them. We're in their place, and, they're mis and, a, and a dragonfly or some kind of thing flew in that was as big as a bird. And it was, they were eating dinner, and it started buzzing and hitting the light. And the wife kind of looked up and said, oh, that's a big one. And that was it. <laughs> so it's got a huge thing. Anyway. 
So I stayed there a night and then ended up heading for the trail. Um, okay, this is a good slide. Let's stay on this a minute. Everything wrong there. Uh, I'm a young guy. Um, I'd never done this before. Um, now, I did, was a Marine, and I had, was in pretty good shape at the time, and I'd been in an SF unit, um, but I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing. I was, I was uh, you know, um, I got the best information I could get out of books. I bought a pack. I brought food. I brought a tent. I brought the things that I thought would work. Um, some things worked and some things didn't, and that's kind of what I want to go into tonight. My first effort here was, was a learning experience. I didn't know. Next slide. One of my big mistakes back then, is that pack at that point weighed about 70 pounds. I was told I'd never make it through the trail. And um, God, 70 pounds, and I was able to dump some of that off, but still that's what I started with, and it was horrific. I'd never, and I'd never, I'd been in the tropics before, but I'd never felt anything carrying that kind of a pack up and down those mountains, down up, which you'll get to see. Next. So I take off. I'm carrying the pack. Steve, you want to add anything at this point? I was going to ask you yeah. when you were mentioned. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's good you're telling everything rapid fire. Mm. You mentioned so to I, me earlier about the, when you met the Seventh Day Adventists. Yeah. In the Enga Province. Mm -hmm. Actually, there on the trail, and it's good. Yeah. I'm glad you reminded so me. So I think that's an interesting story you yeah. need to share. Yeah, yeah, and I'll and I'll, I'll thank you. That's a good one. I need to talk about that. So. Here I am. The guy said, I'll never make it. A French guy just been killed oh, a couple weeks prior in that area. I don't know what happened to him, but they killed him. The locals, pretty violent stuff. And I'm not going to make it. I got my map. It's not much of a map. And I head out. There's a sign. There I go. Next slide. Next thing you know, I'm out in this stuff. And I started off hiking down the most awful, god awful, down, down, down I'd have ever done. I'm falling and stumbling. I'm trying to carry that pack. I dumped off some weight. It probably only weighs about 50 pounds at that point. Uh, I kept some stuff at the Red Shield Center. Okay, stop here. Don't go. Don't go too much faster. Back up a slide too, maybe. Okay. And I and then I start doing these these, these stream and river crossings. But I I got across. And one thing happened while I was walking down the, uh, one of the, the hills and slipping and sliding. I, I needed a stick, and I, and I cut this stick, and I'm just absolutely covered in sweat and tired and beat up and mosquitoes and all this stuff. And I take my knife, and I hack off the stick, and I'm using it. And then I feel this squirming in my hand, and the shit, these things, worms are crawling out of this stick that I pick. It's like, can it get any more disgusting? Well, it did. It, it did. <laughs> but, but it was like, God, not out of the stick. But uh, <laughs> so, so, you know, wild place. So that next, this is the tent I used at the time. That's the first camp. And I read my, 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 um, my uh, log the other day, yesterday, and I was reading about what I thought about it. And at that time, I did not know if I was going to be able to do this. It was so difficult to get to that per first place. And I just said, all right, I just took it like a day at a time. You know, it was so hard to get through that jungle, and I'm carrying this weight. And I just kept moving and moving. That's kind of been the story of my life. You just keep going always forward. You don't have to be the fastest, the strongest, or the smartest, which I rarely am. But you keep going forward. And but so we can see how well Wayne <laughs> continues to go forward all the time. I'm going, well, I'm going forward here, man, trying to get these slides in. And I'll slow down <laughs> if we have to. But there's, there's more important slides coming up, so I'm trying to go through this fast. I'll slow it down a little. All right. Next slide. Next day I get up, put this stuff on, and get going. and back at it. This stuff is, is the trail. That's called kunai grass. That stuff will cut you. That was the other thing. Shorts turned out not to be a good idea um, after being cut by that stuff. These photos you're seeing next are just scenery shots, but could you back up a slide, please? Uh, they're scenery shots, but what's important is, is that that's not what I saw. What I saw was a jungle canopy. Every now and then you'd break out, and when you'd break out of it, it would be spectacular. And so I'd get a shot of what it looked like. But what I was seeing was dark down in the, you know, with the mosquitoes and the leeches and the um, fleas, too, which is something I hadn't experienced. So fleas and things, too, especially in the villages. Next. I just keep going and going, and I'm not sure. Next, another camp. The learning experience. I make camp. I learned quickly to make camp around water, you know, if you could, but not in water where you could have a flood or something and wash it out, but you wanted to be near water so you could wash and stuff. It helped, particularly at the end of the day when you're going to go to sleep, it's better if you could wash off. All right, next slide. Okay. 
this is Naro. The, that was the first real village that I came to, and I hadn't seen anybody out on the trail. It had been a couple of days, a few days. That's an airstrip, grass airstrip. Next, so I walk in and see these huts and end up spending the night in one of the huts. And what Steve had brought up, and I'm glad you did, is the Seventh-day Adventists were a missionary group that at the time kind of controlled the trail. Their missionaries and things were throughout the trail. The problem with that was there was these old photos of when they originally took, um, started their mission activity. And they thought that they wanted to, in order to bring the people to Christ, you had to get rid of everything that they had up to that point of their old beliefs. So there's famous pictures of them with war shields packed in big piles burning. The shields, the spears, the, effort, the carvings, all this stuff will be worth a lot of money. Big pile burning. So the problem with the Gakota track is you got the wartime experience, but you didn't get to see much of the culture because it had been cleaned out by the missionaries. Now I have my own views on missionaries and everybody can, and I've seen a lot of good too that came from those people. But that was something that was an unfortunate thing to happen. And that was part of the problem with the Gakota trail and why when I go on to the next part of these slides, you'll see quite a difference. Next. So through Naro, meet some people, drop some rice I was carrying. Oh, I should say what I was carrying. Sea rations. Now, I'm not, I don't know how many of you are old enough to know how, how heavy sea <coughs> rations were. You know how, many, how heavy sea rations for 10 days are? It's a lot. They're cans, canned food, but I was so afraid of water, of not having water. And so, and so it turned out not to be an issue once I learned how to do the water. So anyway, back to Seventh-day Adventist. I'm walking along. All right. Now hold this one. Steve, you got anything else? Right, because I don't want to... No, no. Go finish the uh, Seventh-day Adventist. I'm going fast. So the Seventh-day Adventist, though, had taken, had, had, had removed the really cool stuff that I wanted to see from the trail. And I saw very little of the, of the Papua culture. But what I was seeing was gun emplacements, dug, dug gun emplacements, places where there'd been some horrific battles. And like I said, I'm not going to go into that tonight, but each one of these campsites was at a place that had had horrific battles between the Japanese and the Australians in 1942. <laughs> terrible, terrible battles. Um, this is an example of a bridge. This is what you'd have to cross. I'm not the most agile. Like I said, I keep going. I'm pretty good about keeping going, but I've never been noted for my agility, so I don't really like these bridges that, uh, uh, you know, where you're, you're balancing yourself. And this is actually a pretty good one. Some might be just a single log, and they, they aren't much fun, and you really don't want to fall. Next. Rained a lot, foggy. The tent I had was kind of small. I, um, it worked, and, uh, but it was um, something that I saw later that I should improve on. Next. Okay, another village. This is classic uh, Kokoda Trail village. Be an open area in the middle, kind of a communal place where they could eat, and then their own separate huts that ran kind of a ring around the place. And this is 1982. Next from the air. Now, folks, this is another thing I want to mention about these photos. These photos are actually scans of old photos that were taken 40-some years ago. I had to actually do some color work on them because they had sort of yellowed, and the place wasn't yellow. It was quite green. So on the color correction, I just cut a green, and it pretty well fixed everything. They're a little odd, but that's more what it looked like than the yellow that the old photos had. Excuse me, Wayne. Yeah. This might be a good point, time to bring up the point you're on the Kokoda Trail, which was part of World War II. Yeah. You should talk about, as you mentioned to me earlier, that the people living there went from the Stone Age mm. to the 1940s in the blink of an eye. And so you were able to experience people who had literally just come out of the Stone Age, but now were accustomed to war, modern war machinery from the 1940s and so yeah. on, airplanes and so on and so forth, which really affected their culture. And you were able to experience that. Maybe you could yeah, say a few thanks, comments thanks about that. that. Yeah, folks, and, and, I, and I meant to go more on the map and exactly what's going on there. New Guinea is one of the most isolated places in the world. Um, I was on the PNG side for this trip, and then later I did four on the other side, which I'll talk about. But but there are, there, New Guinea is so isolated due to this incredible geographic barriers with rivers and streams and high mountain ranges that have cut off people for so long. There's over 700 languages spoken on that island, and that's why. And that's why you have all these incredible diverse cultures, diverse tribal groups, which you'll see in the next group of slides. They, um, they, uh, because of this geographic isolation, and then as Steve mentioned, to be thrust into the 20th century so quickly during the war. And again, I've got to go fast, but some of you may have heard of the cargo cults. 
when the war happened, they're bringing in these cargo planes. These New Guineans thought they were birds at first. Uh, they didn't know what these things were, and they started circling, and it scared the hell out of them. Then they landed, and all this stuff started coming out. Good stuff, stuff they wanted. And then and they started a cargo cult to try to get the planes to come back. And there's a famous photo of a plane made of wicker up on top of a mountain that this tribal group had put to try to attract another one to come back and bring some more stuff. <laughs> they want stuff. So, so you know, to this day, that's something when you go to New Guinea, another term I've heard people call is Papa, you give me. Because they're, they're used to the, the, the Westerner, whatever you're called, just giving, you, giving them everything. They get used to that. And it's kind of a, it's, it turns kind of negative sometimes. And I have uh, a few Did that happen to you? Did it you? happened to me a few times where I was the golden goose. And, um, you know, I was looking through my logs and some, some of the things I had with people asking for insane things, you know, that maybe, maybe someone from Europe had come and given them a bunch of stuff. But it, it did it did happen a few times. So you're seeing here's some more villages along the trail. Um, uh, next, it's kind of you can look at these are kind of cool. The traditional the traditional uh, here we are 20th century and you still got traditional fast huts and also some metal that they'd bring in fly in or they'd actually walk and carry it in. Um, standard village. Next the next slide to be something. Next, please, that I would stay in at night if I was in a village. I preferred a jungle camp. I always preferred to stay out. But the advantage of staying in this hut was I could set my tent up inside. And if it got rained, it, my tent would be dry the next day when I folded it up to get out of there. And I like that. The problem is you're in there maybe with animals or with fleas and sure rats. I had problems with rats. <laughs> ate one of my hats one time. Um, it really <laughs> problem. But um, OK, next slide. All right. This is the kind of stuff you'd find on the trail. This is a, any aviation guys want to hazard what kind of aircraft this propeller came off of. Uh, it was big and heavy. I would have carried it out, which you shouldn't do. But as a young man, it's like, wow, this would look nice in my house. Well, that's a, probably a World War II aircraft that crashed or something, more than likely. But it was heavy and too big for me to carry. Uh, it's still there. Hopefully, it's still there. That's something like that should never, should never leave. Um, but that's the kind of thing you'd see. All right, bamboo, um, very nice. I'd never seen bamboo. Okay, I'm getting co close to the kind of the end of the trail here. More, okay, I'll slow down a little bit here. Back up, please. I'm getting close, to, kind of close to the end of the trail. Uh, another bridge crossing, and each one of these villages is part of this famous battle. Like I said, you could spend a lifetime studying the battle and what happened, and that was something that interested me at the time, but then I was more interested really in the people, which I wasn't really gonna see here. Next, this plaque was quite heavy, and it was in the middle of a terrible battle that occurred where I think they really repulsed the Japanese. Uh, they had, the Japanese were, assaulting in these bonsai charges with swords and absolutely horrific. And these Australians were standing their ground. There was a lot to the battle. It seesawed back and forth. But in the end, the Australians prevailed and were able to push the Japanese back to Kokoda and prevent the Japanese from taking Port Moresby. Incredibly gallant men and, and some terrible casualties that occurred. Several thousand Japanese and maybe a thousand or so uh, of the Australians. Just, just terrible fighting. Next. What I saw a lot of is this fog. When you're up at that kind of altitude, your fog is wet. You can't see. Next. This is what I see. This guy's name was Billy. He had a son. You can see how glad he is to, <coughs> he, how glad he is to see me. Um, kids were scared. And whenever they'd see me, that was something that would kind of go through New Guinea, which you'll see later in other places. But the kids don't know what you are. And in fact, I was reading in my diary something I'd forgot. It was in my log that one of the tribal people that I could talk to told me that they would tell their kids, you be good, or, or you know, we have the boogeyman, the boogeyman's gonna get you. They had, you be good, or the white man's gonna get you. So, you know, here I show, I was like, holy shit, one's here. <laughs> so, so uh, Wayne, yeah. so if you look at this man here, uh, his teeth don't look so great. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could explain what, what the custom is in New Guinea, yeah, and why they have a problem, dental problems. Yeah, Steve brought in a nice prop for tonight, one of the lime, then the spatula that they use. The, they, they, if anyone has been there, they'll, they'll know that the, they chew betel nut. A betel nut is a narcotic, and they'll chew it, and then they'll have their lime, and they place, I don't remember the order, but they got to have a little bit of a lime to yeah, it comes neutralize. Out of here. Like that. And then the betel nut, and it's red, and it turns their whole mouth red, and then they spit. And if you're in a place like Moresby or some of these, there's red spit all over the place from where they, they've had the betel nut. 
It's not good. So the dental, some dental problems and other. It rots your teeth, basically. Could, yeah, well, yeah, I mean, there's a reason they're using the lime, I imagine, you know. Next. All right, so I'm finishing up the trail, and um, it's hard to do it justice, but I'm alone. Remember, there's, I've been out more than a week, seven, ten days, and I've never seen anybody except in a village. There's nobody hiking. They, they had enough sense not to go out there, I guess. Um, next, and I'm coming down through the mountains, and uh, I can kind of see I'm getting close to the end, and I'm, at that point, I'm feeling pretty good about myself, thinking I'm doing this. I'm actually going to do it. My pack weighed much less. I dropped off some of the cans. I'd eaten some of the cans, and I was able to, to keep, you know, just to keep, to keep moving. Next. Okay. This is at the, the big more, the memorial park at the end of the, uh, at the end of the Kokoda Trail that commemorates, you know, the great battle and the valiant effort from the Japanese, from the, for the Australians, you know, pushing the Japanese back. And, um, uh, next. And this slide that I took and I wrote about it kind of emotionally that, uh, that was the hardest thing I'd done in life, much harder than anything I'd done in the ASF unit or much harder than anything in the Marines or anything I had done. And I wrote that I, I took this photo and, it, and it, it's everything I, I ever wanted to, to be. And I hope the photo comes out and it, it came out. Next. I'm finished. I did the Kokoda track. Went, came back to the U.S. I got interviewed by a radio station um, because it just wasn't being done, the Kokoda Trail back then, and the radio station Morrisby interviewed me. I came back to the U.S., and um, a couple years later, I decided to go to the Amazon on a short trip, and it worked. It turned out to be a real disaster. I'm not going to go into it um, other than to show a couple of slides, but um, uh, killed wait, in the Amazon. Wait, and, uh, yeah. Question I have in this picture, you look pretty dapper there. Yeah. Is that before or after the trip? Yeah, that was in the trip. That's really uh, <laughs> in, in a, on a day when, when probably I was supposed to have been killed. But, um, but I'm in Brazil. Um, did we lose our program? See, that slide would do that to you. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm in Brazil, actually crossed the border from Colombia. I was in Colombia in a... It's a long story, and it's Columbia, 1985. You know what was going on down there? And I'm alone in the Amazon walking through there. The people I met, the things that happened, it wasn't very good. Anyway, next. All right. Are you guys seeing anything, or is it black? Yeah. Okay. I'm, 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 I don't have a screen. Am I, am I on the newspaper slide? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, you can kind of see what happened. Plane crash. I was a little on it, listed as on it, and um, uh, okay, I, uh, fortunately, I've lost this screen here, so I don't know where we're at. Okay. I think you're back here in Papua, in yeah. Garoka. Yeah. Newspaper articles. No, newspaper articles. Okay, newspaper, newspaper article. article. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go find those. I'll go find those, the negatives. I've not looked at them in all those years, and then maybe we can do a program on what happened down there. It was uh, not a good situation. But I got back to the United States, and I remember uh, a fellow, when I got back, because it was a mess. They were identifying bodies. They didn't know if it was me or not, and it was a problem. I was married at the time. Um, not for long after, but um, the thing was, uh, <laughs> now nah, a while after. But the point is, is that uh, it was a bad thing for her. They're identifying bodies. They don't know if I'm on it or not. And um, is your screen going off and on or not? This okay, good. That's all that matters. I just I can't follow. I don't know what's going on up here. Um, I guess I can start making stuff up now. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, the point is, is that and I'm not a belabor that, but it was a it was a real problem. And um, I came back and, a, and a, one of my uh, I remember one of the guys' friends said to me. Uh, boy, I bet that after what happened to you, that took the wind out of your sails. Well, it didn't. You know, that was that's it's a damn shame, and I feel bad every you know July 25th thinking of what happened to all those people that crashed in the jungle and how close I came to being on that aircraft. But um, I went on and then ended up uh, ended up in uh, uh, going back to um, PNG in 1986. And hopefully this will stay. Can you back up a little bit? Back up one? Okay. Okay. Um, so I returned in 1986. This is what I wanted to see. I wanted to see the people. I wanted to see the, the, the people that I didn't see on the Kokoda track. I got to see the wartime stuff, but I didn't get to see cool people. Those are cool people from Southern Highlands. Next. I'm going to point this out. It doesn't really matter. What I did was, as I checked on New Guinea, and I checked on 
uh, you know, on what was going on there, and I learned more. I found from my first trip that the wildest part of New Guinea was Inga Province. Inga Province was supposedly the most violent, had the worst terrain up in the mountains, and, and so naturally I was attracted. So I went back in 1986, and the first thing I did was went to the Highland Show in Garoka. Next. Uh, this is Garoka. Um, the Highland Show is something that they do every year in New Guinea, and it's very fascinating. The government's got together, and they'll either have it in Garoka or they'll have it in Mount Hagen. I'll bet there's people here that have been there, right? Anybody? People in there? Okay. Uh, it, um, I used to you know, kind of downplay like a tourist thing, because it kind of is, because the problem I always had with it is people take these fantastic photos, and they come back and say, look where I was, and what they don't <coughs> say is, yeah, but there's a hotel 100 feet away, and you were drinking a beer while you took this photo. But that's a lot of the whole adventure thing, which just drives me nuts. Anyways, I, but I did want to see, I did want to see it because it's an amazing event where these people, these tribal groups brought together to peacefully coexist for a few days. And they they con they're in contest, tribal groups, they sing, they dance, they drum, and the government's thinking is it'll pull them together for something more positive than killing each other, which would be the natural thing they'd want to do with most of the, some of these some of these folks. This one was in Garoka. Next. I show up and I stay. I mean, with the, it's still in my tent, but now I'm in a, I wasn't in a hotel, I was in a tent, in the police compound. I was with the, met the police there. Um, that's a whole other experience. Next. So you actually pay an admission, you go in and you get fantastic photos. And this is me with my camera, which isn't very good. And these are actually scans of photos. So that takes the quality even lower. Still, you can't mess this up. These Yahuli from the Southern Islands are pretty amazing looking characters, even with a photographer like me. Next, I mean, you get to see some stuff there. It's a, it, it, it is truly amazing, the, the things you'll see. And like I say, I used to kind of not be embarrassed, but I downplay these things. And then I looked at them for, for the first time on a bigger screen the other day. I thought, man, yeah, I've caught some things here that you won't see again. Some of these people no longer exist. This is 1985. Next. I mean, many of these people are next, please, are dead. Um, this due to that many years or whatever, and who knows, there might be tribal groups that are no, you know, no longer exist. So even what I thought of tourist photos at the time, they're still pretty interesting to show the incredible uh, Papuan culture. Next, a Highlander, um, let's see the bone through his nose. Next, oh, another high, classic <coughs> Highlander with the wig, and I'll go into that a little bit more in the big shell, the big bailiff shell. Next. Some probably from the coast, and just, I mean, that's the, that's a, you won't see that very often in life. A guy like that, um, it's straight out of the bush. These are bushy people that have come out to Mount Hagen, and there are thousands of them living around there and staying in the bushes and all that. Next. Now, this, stay on this slide. Don't go too fast here, because you don't want to miss this. We, I was here one night, and now, Steve, I don't know if you were here, but the topic came up, the filthiest restroom you've ever been in. <laughs> Folks, I don't, I don't care. I don't think you can compete with this. And I don't like to be the one-upper. I really goddamn well don't want to be the one-upper. I've never liked that. And I try to, I'll normally maybe wouldn't tell a story that does it. But goddamn, this story, this thing. There's a thousand tribesmen from all over in this, in this place. <clears throat> they don't stay in hotels. They're staying in the bush. They're sleeping in God knows what. They've never been in a restroom before. And this isn't designed for a thousand tribesmen, this little men's thing here, keep them clean. It's not designed for it. I go, I gotta go, I go in, and right away I see there's water running out the door. And what the hell is this? And they had a water closet. You know those things that men know urinate on the wall? It's like a whole wall, and the water kind of comes down. Problem is, these tribesmen didn't really know what that was, and they just backed up and shit in it. <laughs> You've already eaten, so anyway. But it was the amounts. It was the amounts that I couldn't believe. <laughs> so you want to tell your, filthy, your story about filthiest restroom, unless you've got piles of excrement like this along a wall, and water's running through it, and out and out, and you're standing at it, and they're barefoot. They're barefoot. They don't know. They go in and back up, and the next one goes. That's, so that's my filthy, filthiest. <laughs> 
and it's nothing I'm proud of, but at the time, I couldn't believe it. Okay, next. So, I, I backed up to it and shit. What do you think? <laughs> I did. I did. Oh, God, I did something once. Okay, anyway, next. Let's not go into that. <laughs> next, please. Okay, here's a cool thing because of what it shows is these folks, um, and you can see on their back the, the, the hornbill. It's the cask of the hornbill uh, that each one has. And I ended up bringing a bunch of those back that I bought from a trade store that they use. You'll see it in various decorations, the hornbills. Next, that's incredible Highlander. That's a classic Highlander. Next. All right, here's an interesting one, because this guy's a wig man from Fryenga province, and he's got a bird of, he's got bird of cassowary feathers that probably top, top is going to top his headdress. Fantastic people. All right, next. I don't even know what to say about that, but I would just say <laughs> that it's, it's interesting. Interesting. Next. Okay. The, the bead, the, the Job's pearl, whatever they call those things, uh, the, the beads uh, used extensively. Next, some of these people said very, very primitive. And you know, the word primitive is kind of falling out of vogue, but just using it as a term for people that, you know, um, you know, um, you know don't, don't, uh, don't have all the technological things that we have. Some of these folks didn't. And of course, this is years ago, too. Hell, they're all probably wearing T-shirts and Seiko watches now that uh, carrying laptops. And <laughs> no, nah, probably not. Next. All right. These are very interesting because this is what I really came to see. These are more the Wigmen from Enga province. They are a formidable bunch. And I'll go into that a little more later. Next. And you got some guy like this wearing like jaws. <laughs> this, it's a net with just jaws hanging on it. Um, God, I don't know why. But next. All right. This is more Enga province men. Uh, the roughest province in PNG. And the, those wigs are made of human hair. The, the V-looking wigs you see, that's human hair that's been put together. And I heard they get it from themselves. They get it from their wives, I'm sure, donate it <laughs> voluntarily, I hope. Um, and God knows where else. All right. Okay. Um, more people. Next. All right. This is important. Don't go up this one too fast. This is, these are wig men, of, again, of Enga province, which I would meet later up, up, up in Enga province. Here I'm actually in, in the highlands uh, around in Goroka, uh, eastern highlands, I think that, that is, I think, still. But this is at the Sing Sing, the big K4 Sing Sing. Next. All right. These are the mud men of Asaro Valley. Now, stay on this slide. Go back there. Stay on this, because it, the, the mud men... If you've been to New Guinea, you've probably seen they actually sell the mud masks now, but they're very sophisticated looking now. The masks they have have eyelashes and nice lips, and it looks like a clay thing. But the original legend goes that the, the people living in the Asaro Valley, there was a tribe that was routed by its enemies. Being routed, they were running for it, and they ended up running into this murky, messy place where when they came out, they were covered in mud. And according to their legend, that other tribes said, oh shit, they're spirits, and they ran off. So they've stayed with that practice of being the mud men of, Asaro, of the Asaro Valley, and now it's more of a tourist thing, and they make the more sophisticated masks. But those are the more classic old Asaro Valley mud men masks from many years ago. Next. I don't know. This guy was something else. Um, next. All right. <laughs> See this, uh, the, the different looks. And I, okay, slow down here a little bit. So that was pretty much the, 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 the show. And I kind of went through those fast, but they were, um, they were, uh, uh, it was amazing getting to see that. And I, and I, I, all those years I'd kind of downplayed that event, but those are really some interesting photos of people you'll never see again. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I did that. But the point was then to leave and head out into Inga province. Steve, did you have something? You okay? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm listening, right. fascinating listening you're, to you. you're catching stuff I'm missing here, no. blasting. Well, you know, you might want to mention, it's kind of funny for many of us here, but the, uh, what the men often wear. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't, unfortunately, I'd been to Papua yeah. myself at the same time he was there. Yeah. So I brought this, but I didn't have other things to bring. And Wayne didn't have one of these most yeah. famous piece of male wardrobe. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, it looks like a, it looks like a, a gourd, a long kind of gourd thing. And um, um, it actually is some kind of a, a gourd. And they take, and it's hollow, and it's, it depends on the length and the size, depending on di different things. 
Um, I, I saw one once, in a, and it was in a gift shop when I was on the Indonesian side, and a bunch of tourists coming from Bali were, were, were looking at them. And one of the guys didn't know what it was, and he put it on his nose and has a string and tied it on the back of his, tied it on the back of his head, and he's wearing this thing. And then I told him it was a penis sheath. And then he, he quickly came off his nose, but that's what the wear, and that's actually where I was trying to head in, in this trip, which I ended up being stopped by a river, but the telephone area, and head out into that. But that's what they were in some of the places. It, later you'll see, if you come back, I've got some other presentations that if this is at all popular, I can show, uh, I can show some areas where that, it's that primitive still. You know, I, Wayne? Yeah. There also, when I was in New Guinea, at least in the lowland areas, the men are often uh, scarred to look like crocodiles. Mm. When they reach, uh, you know, they're becoming of age, yeah, yeah. they take and they make cuts and they pack it with mud. So they'll get a lumpy scar and look, their skin will look like a crocodile. I don't know if they did that in the Highlands or not, or if you ran into that. They or maybe they wanted to do that to you. Yeah, well, you know, a few experiences with that, but it didn't work out for them. Anyway, um, <laughs> the thing is, the thing is, is uh, yeah, that's what's interesting is, and that's good you mentioned this ritual that they do. And it's so rich in ritual. Each tribal group will have their own things. And like you say, along the coast, they'll do this thing where their backs to look like a crocodile. They'll put, I don't know what they do, put muddy, they put something in there. And it makes this raised impressions on their skin. And it, they might have the back of a crocodile, which is pretty cool. Uh, but, but each one of these areas is known for having these certain traditions and rituals. And that's what's so fascinating about New Guinea is because of this geographic isolation, you'll have so many different types of that type of thing. Um, I was reading in my diary, I'd forgotten about it. They're one of the things that's pretty gruesome. Uh, the women, when a, one of their children dies, cuts their fingers off, cuts a finger off, and they'll keep the finger. And I think I saw someone wearing their finger, wearing the finger, and I couldn't believe it. Jesus Christ, how did that happen? They lost a child, so they cut their finger off. Well, if you lose more than one, you end up losing fingers. It's a real, real, it's a real interesting thing. But, but, but they'll do that. And that, they'll, that, that's something that is, is in their tradition. So I'm in the PMV, uh, the truck, and I'm heading, I'm heading wet, west toward Inga province. Next. So I was at a tourist event in Garoka, but I show up at Wabag, and then I go past Wabag, and then I end up in this village. I don't know if this is Ligum village. I don't remember the name. But I end up in a real deal, a real sing sing, not the tourist stuff. Uh, next. And I make friends immediately. Um, these are wigmen of uh, 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 Inga wigmen with the with the human hair with the human hair um, wigs. And the first thing they do, they're very very nice people. Next, they're eating. Next, please. And they offer me the brains of the pig. You can see his head and then the brains, which is not a good thing. Steve and I were discussing earlier one of the worst, one of the most the most isolated diseases in the world comes from contaminated brains. That's it. it happens in a certain little geographical place in New Guinea. It's called something like Kukuku or something like that, but it's from brains. So I, in general, avoid brains. Next. <laughs> Whenever possible. That's All right, so here they are, the drum line. And um, man, these people are something fierce. I'll tell you what, they don't mess around. Uh, they got those kundu drums, and they start pounding and marching. And I didn't realize until I read my book, I read my diary, they were whistling, too, at the same time. So it's really imposing. The whole point is it's to instill fear in an enemy. And I can see if you saw these guys, it'd be a lot like the Zulus in Africa who also had their thing pounded on the shields and stuff to scare their enemies. Next. There's a, one of the drum lines, and it is, when they're moving forward and doing that, it absolutely catches your attention. So I got to spend a night. It's too bad I can't discuss it all because it was absolutely insane what happened there. They can drink, and when they drink, they fight, and um, they were drinking a lot. So um, the cheap cases of this gin, this cheap gin, and they went crazy that night. Uh, interesting reading some of the things I did, but anyway, beyond the scope of this. Next. So I wanted to head out from there and go farther east. My whole, my whole thing was to get out as far as I could, out as far as I could in Inga province and past. So I start walking. I think I might even been in a truck for a little bit, but mostly I'm on foot next. And then finally the road stops, and I end up in this place where I'm just, it's bush time. Now I've got a different pack and stuff, which I'll show you. It was a whole different, I'd learned some things from PNG, learned a few things from that, from my first trip. 
First thing I noticed was the people were much bushier looking, much more traditional, um, much more, you know, like what I, what I wanted to see rather than the people along the Kokoda track that had clothes and t-shirts and such that the missionaries had brought. You got to see more natural people out here. And I'm up in altitude uh, next, and, and um, I read the, in my diary some of the things I wrote about much harder than the Kokoda Trail, the trail, which I'll show a few. Terrible, terrible hard going, and I had no map. I got, I see in my book diary, in my log, I was making a map and trying to figure where I was, and boy, I learned a lesson from that. That didn't work out so well. Next, um, more, of the, more of the wig men, uh, again, out in Inga province, far western Inga province. Next, this is my pack. Next slide, please. That's a Gregory. It's a pretty good brand. Two and a half day pack, and I wanted it to last about 10 days. So I had really concentrated the food in there. And by then I knew, too, I could get some food in villages. It was possible to eat some of their food. I wasn't as afraid of it as I was the first time. Something that I learned. Um, I learned. The trail. I don't know if this slides upside down. I looked at it and looked at it. I wasn't sure. It doesn't matter. That was the trail. It was horrific. It was truly horrific. Uh, it's, it, so I'm walking along and I'm heading east. I'm kind of trying to get to this Lake Copiago. I'm trying to get to this thing. I kind of know where I'm going. I got a compass. I run into this guy and he had, was working for a missionary. We talk. He's very, very, very rudimentary English, but you see he had Western pants and shirt. He's wearing a couscous hat though, made of the, made of the, the marsupial. Couscous. And then he said, I'll be your guide. Then I was told I would never find it, never, unless I had some kind of a guide. And I really, really didn't want to have a guide. But it was so horrific that first time I did, first time I've ever you'd done that. Next. But not only was he a guide, he carried my pack, which was a godsend, as awful as that trail was. And then we'd get these tag along kids. But it was a bitch. But what was nice was getting to meet these people, especially back then, that were so natural. Next. The kids were amazing. These little kids were just amazing. Kids are kids. I never had kids, so I don't know anything about that kind of thing. But, um, but they're cool. And um, I have cats. Anybody have cats? Yeah. God damn, I have 25 cats. <laughs> my, wife, my wife did it when I was at the South Pole. Or before. Back up, please. One slide. She went crazy. But anyway, I love cats. Uh, I got a lot of cats. And I know everyone's name, and I know the habits of everyone, and I know who gets along with it. It's fun. All right. Kids, kids I guess, kind of like that, but, um, but I don't have kids. Next. The going was rough, and it's really rough. And in, the, in, my, in my log, talking about it, what I wrote was, it was horrific. Um, you'll see next. And these people became just, the term, next please, was... Uh, bushier and bushier, you started to see more of them wearing things like the grass and wearing leaves and wearing, they didn't have clothes anymore. And you started seeing, um, next please, you see those people, how they just blend in. They're out hunting, they're kids, and they're carrying bows and arrows and out hunting for their families. Bushy people, they were living off the land, they knew how to do that. Next, classic kid. Next, another one. Leaves and bushes as his clothes. <coughs> you know, that's, that's getting out. When you're starting to see that stuff, you're getting out there. So I'd been out for days and days. I'd come into a village. Um, it's kind of different than the Kokoda thing because it was the people were, you know, there weren't white missionaries ever or anything like that. I'd come into the village and uh, um, be the same thing every time, get met by these people, kind of amazed. Usually uh, bushwalkers wouldn't go through a place like that. They'd be smart enough not to, I guess. Next. And you'd meet, you know, I'd get the, I'd get the, the meet and greet from these folks. Um, uh, amazing people. Next. Same thing. Usually sometimes spend the night in the villages, although I prefer to be out and with my tent, then head out, you know, try to get out the next day um, and then get back on the trail that I could find. Um, and I had a guide for a while, and then I didn't. That stopped. I have read in my diary something that was pretty awful. I'd forgotten about all these years. I had a, I was in a village, and we were going to go the next day, and I had a guy that agreed to carry my pack and show me through this horrific area ahead that I had to get to. <laughs> and the next morning, there were two of them, and the one guy wouldn't come out of his house. Just stay on that slide, please. He wouldn't come out. He wouldn't go. He changed his mind. No one goes there. Why would he go to this place I wanted to go to? He wouldn't come out. He just stopped. The other guy said he was sick, but he'd try to go, and he... he he went, and he's carrying the pack, and we were having a hard time. And I don't know if he was sick. I think he was shamming a little because he just didn't want to go. Now, let me say this, and I saw this more on the Indonesian side later. 
but I, I wrote about it back then. See, they have tribal wars. You could have a, a carrier from one village. It can't go to the next village because they're at war. I really saw this on the Indonesian side, which is more primitive. I really saw that um, on the Indonesian side. But even here, I mean, they fight. And so they can't go. And I've had it, and you just, you know, you can't push some guy forward that's going to get killed if he goes to the next village. So that can be the problem. In this case, they just didn't want to go. And there was, I saw why. After I got out there, it's like, who the hell would go here? Me. Um, next, please. Uh, the women. Um, and it's interesting to see that what looks like an old lady there, she's probably not very old. Um, the life is fairly hard. Uh, uh, I don't know what the, I used to know that what the average age is, but it's, they're probably not, they're probably, you know, I don't think their lifespan with the diseases they face because they get malaria and there's some terrible forms of malaria and all kinds of other things that you can get from living in that kind of a location. Next. Okay, more what it looked like. A beautiful, beautiful country. You'd come out of the you'd come out of the jungle canopy. It was absolutely beautiful. But most of the time, you're down there in the dirt and the we the the creeks and the mud and the uh, you know leeches and the fleas. I forgot about the fleas until I read my, my logs again. The fleas were fun um, on top of the leeches and things. Next, this isn't this next slide is interesting. He's got an umbrella. You see that? Uh, they do get umbrellas in the highlands, and they, you know, there's a lot of rain, and also I think maybe even the, the sun is intense in a place like that. But if you had some money, he probably went to some trade store in Hagen at some point and got himself an umbrella. Next. Kids. The kids are great, and although I had a thing I wrote about that I'd forgotten about having a couple kids, I told them where I was going, and they said they'd guide me. And they, they knew a shortcut. <laughs> what I wrote about that shortcut, oh, it was Absolutely awful, awful, awful. And if you're a little kid and you're not carrying anything and you live in that place, climbing rocks, doing this, doing that, that's shorter for them. For me, I got the pack, I'm doing it, it was awful. And I told them at the end, I gave them some money, I gave them some stuff, and I said, if you ever guide anyone else, a tourist or through here, do not go that way. Don't do that to them. So, next. <laughs> All right. There you go. See the see the net the, through the, the nasal septum the the, the um, wood that he's got through there to keep the hole open. He'd probably have a bone in there or something normally, uh, pig bone or something like that. But that keeps it open because I guess it closes up if you don't. It's like a piercing. I never had a piercing, but I think they'll close up. So they they'll keep a plug in their nose most of the time. Next, this is an interesting photo, and I wrote about it. He's got a spear. This guy is walking around with a spear out in the bush. Um, then you could go back a thousand years and you see something like this, you know, with a spear. Next, classic river crossing, and across the river, and my feet would get wet, and my feet were in terrible shape. I talked about how bad it was and how I ended up using electric tape, and because of the blisters and things that happened, I'd wrapped electric tape around my toes. That seemed to help for some reason. I had a photo of that once. It's pretty distasteful, but uh, it wasn't fun. Um, guy out. Out hunting with his with his son. Next, a classic camp that I would have had set up in the bush with all the, the stuff that goes with that classic camp. Still using that same tent. Oh, this was stay on this slide a moment because this is important. I did run here. I ran into people. Kokoda track, not much, but out here people were, you know, no white people, but no tourists. But I ran into the villagers going, this guy's carrying a pig, a squealing pig. Yeah, you know, pig is heavy and he's squealing and moving. But this guy's strong enough to where it's quicker for him to carry the pig rather than to try to leash it and make it walk forward. To, you have to be strong. He's walking across it like a wooden bridge there. And he just ran off carrying that pig squealing. So those people, they're extremely strong, those Highlanders. And by this time, I'm actually out of the Highlands. I didn't realize it until I looked at my logs and I looked at some maps. I've crossed out of the Highlands and I'm in another sector heading down more into the swampy areas that go to the coast. Next. This is important. That's a, that's a, they said they had a baby cassowary in there. Cassowary, the large flightless bird, very dangerous when they're big. They're like an ostrich, and they're known to um, be able to kick with the big, you know, you know how big an ostrich is. They're not as big as an ostrich, but they're big. They have a lethal kick in these big spiked toes. They'll actually use the toes for the tips of spears and arrows and things. They had a baby. Um, they say when they hunt the cassowary, they have a guy, they have a couple going forward and one guy looking back because the cassowaries are known to attack from the back. So you're out here with a bow and this thing comes up behind you. So that's what I've heard anyway. So they've got a cassowary. Next, the riverbed. And I wrote in there that it was filled with fossils. And I, as a kid, loved fossils. So 
talk about that more when I was in the Indonesian side where I stopped to collect them. But, you know, a lot went on there, and it has a history that goes back to, you know, any geologist in here would understand more what's happening with the, with the, with the history, and, or excuse me, with the, the fossil life uh, in, in Papua, but it's quite rich. Next. An old man, uh, and I learned, I learned this more in, uh, when I was on the Indonesian side later, but I'd, I'd learned to check out what kind of arrows they were carrying. Arrows were for different things, and if a guy was carrying a bunch of the big, heavy black palm ones, those are for people, and you want to watch out. And uh, there they could be like a tribal war going on. Um, these were hunting-type arrows, but I didn't know that. These are things I learned, little, little tips, and I had some interesting things happen. Uh, <laughs> next, all right. This is interesting because I have that bone that's through his nose. I didn't realize I had a photo of the guy, but I was just looking at it the other day. It's where the, my house is filled with this stuff. But uh, I have that bone through his nose, that was through his nose. Very nice. Next. Okay. Go back a thousand years here. Yeah. So I get to the end of the trail. I'm trying to head to a place called Aksatman, and then there's the Strickland River. And it turned out the Strickland River, there had been a bridge, and the Strickland River, the bridge was gone. It's a raging whitewater, monstrous. There's no way I could get across. So at that point, I actually go on a bit more. These slides don't show it. I think I ran out of film, because there was some horrific stuff that was in my, that was in my, um, in my log. One was the back one of the carriers, and I called him by name in the book, but I he collapsed one day. It was a terrible place we were, and he just was standing up, and he had, and he fell backwards into this grass. And I thought he was dead in the in the log. I checked him to see if he was still alive. I know he was sick, but I actually thought he was dead for a few moments. And uh, he kind of sprung to, and he was okay. But it was not a good place, and he got sick, and it was not a not a very pleasant experience. Next, so I get to a place that had a that had an airstrip, and then I um, ended up flying out. It's a little bit out of order, but it doesn't matter. It shows you that's the classic little MAF, Mission Aviation Fellowship plane, that operates to this day, still in isolated parts of the world, and in New Guinea, they bring stuff for the missionaries. Next. From the air, you can see, I think that's the Strickland River. Um, uh, geez, from the air, it looks so easy, you know? Like when I was at the South Pole, I remember my last flight, I write about it in my book, looking at the places I'd walked, all those 4,000 miles through that South Pole area. But from the air, it's like, oh my God, everything looks so close, and it did in that aircraft. Next. Okay. And stay on this slide, please, for a minute. This is the hero slide from the end. Um, I learned a lot from this trip. I learned that I wasn't going to go back to Papua again. I'd learned <laughs> that I would go to a place that I found was rougher than that, and that was what was known as Irian Jaya at that time. The Irian Jaya was, um, was um, uh, uh, more primitive. The mountains were higher. It was less known. The maps actually had places in those years that I was there that had unknown elevations. Now it's all mapped by satellite, but it wasn't. So I ended up doing four trips over there after this to some areas that I don't know if anyone's been through. But I learned so much from these trips, and I, and I came back realizing that, that I needed to change a few things. Got a new hat, got a better, bigger tent, got some new gear. Um, the mentality still worked, but I, uh, I, uh, I learned a lot from these trips. Now, the last thing I want to finish up with is people ask me, They'll come to my house, and my house looks like this place. And they'll come to my house, and they'll say, oh, they'll see all my stuff. Oh, how'd you get into this? And I never know how to, how the hell am I supposed to answer? How, what? Did I, well, I was 25, and I said, you know what? I'm not very adventurous. I'm going to be adventurous. For me, it wasn't like that. I knew, I knew what I was going to be. Next, last slide, please. <laughs> when I was a kid, I started young. So, so I knew, basically, and of course there are nuances. I didn't know where I'd end up at that time, where I'd be working around the world, all things I would do. But I think we all, all of us, have a certain, uh, a certain thing we're born with. And I'm sure many of you could tell that kind of a story, too, as far as something that you knew at a young age. It maybe flight was something that interested you. Maybe dancing, maybe something, you know, there was something, in cars, you were interested in these things. But I was interested in, a, as a young boy, in exploring and, 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 you know, getting out and seeing things. And 
I chose a life that didn't include children that did because that would have stopped that and to do it right anyway, to do it right for a kid. It wasn't right to be taken off and doing that stuff. At least I felt so, I mean, whatever anyone else thinks. But for me, the life I've led being gone so many years overseas, it took being solo that way. And, um, but I knew as a kid. So um, I did it, but I did it. And uh, if anybody enjoys this, I do have several other things. That Amazon thing was a mess, and maybe I can put something together for that. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a long trip, but it was pretty bad what happened. And then, um, and then these trips to Erie and Jaya afterwards, <coughs> which got out into goddamn places that went off the map. And, but by then, I knew a lot more than I knew, because I was very young, and I learned. And what I'd say is thank you all, Steve. Thank you for what you've done to, 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 to help me get through this thing. <laughs> thank you for being here and putting up with something like me. You folks out in TV land or wherever it's called now or on the internet. Internet land. Internet, it's called the internet. Oh yeah, I did, did I mention, uh, I, did, I did mention the thing with the hats because it's the faux pas, but the conditioner, anyway, the hat. You, know, you shouldn't wear a hat indoors. But God damn, I hear All right, thank so you. Wait, 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 yeah. wait, wait, wait. I got don't it. run away, don't run away. We got a little time for a few questions, so. which I'm sure some of you have. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not often, <coughs> excuse me, we meet someone like Wayne, who's been through so much and can probably talk about this for the next year. Yeah. I'm sure you have That's many good. misadventures <laughs> that occurred along those trails. I'm leaving the bad stuff out, folks. Right. Okay. So let's ask a few questions. Yeah. So first of all, Wayne, I'll start off. Uh, sure. Lance Miller, 1222. First of all, I want to thank you. When I was a senior in high school, I was in South Pacific as a CB, and I sang Bloody Mary's Chewing Beetle Nuts. Oh, yeah. And I had no idea what beetle nuts were, so I, I, I'm glad to know what that is. A couple questions. When you had a 70-pound pack, how much of that was food? Most all. Okay. And that was, so. the, that was the good thing, because I knew when I wrote about it that I'd eat it along the way, and it would get lighter and lighter. I wasn't carrying bricks or anything like that. But yeah. so it was food, and it was canned food, really heavy. The other thing I'm curious about, most of the huts I saw were on stilts. Was that because yeah. of rain, or was that to keep snakes out, or what was that? Well, I think the rain. I mean, the rain there, you guys, you guys I'm from Texas. I flew in from Texas to do this. Um, I lived in California a long time, by the way. Then I moved to Texas. Anyway, um, uh, the thing is, is that you got some rain here recently, didn't you? How many inches did you get? Twelve inches. Yeah, I got 12. That's a lot for this place. But you could have that in a place like New Guinea, uh, you know, and it'd be normal. It gets hundreds of inches. I mean, it gets incredible, the rain. And, it, and of course, when I'm alone out there, I don't get as, I, I got better photos later. I learned a little bit more to, to, that I think will tell a better tale. But you're wet. You're always wet always wet. If it's not the rain, it's sweat. And then the leeches and the fleas and the mosquitoes and all these other fun, and snakes. And I've got some good snake stories in the next two or so. Yeah, terrible. Who's got a question? Yeah. Did you carry a firearm? Not on this trip. I would have liked to have. Thank you. So I noticed in one of the photos that you there was a market. What sort of currency do they have? Yeah, yeah, they have they have um, the currency of the of of PNG is the kina, and the kina is based on a kina which was like a shell from years ago. Um, it, that's it kept the name, but uh, the currency is now the kina. And at the time, you know, what I remember it was actually valued at more. That one kina was like a dollar thirty six or something. The the bushier you get, the more you are able to actually trade stuff, but they do have currency, the Kina. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that you got the bone from the guy's nose. Yeah. How did you get that? It was a hell of a match, I'll tell you what. <laughs> nah, I, I'm, I'm, sure I, I'm sure I bought it from him. You know, I gave him, I gave him, and I've done that several times where I, I've got a great photo at home in the Osmot of this guy, unbelievable, with this incredible car bone through his nose and pig tooth, or a, uh, what's it, dog tooth necklace, and I have it. You know, when I was a young guy, I was, for, I was like a vacuum cleaner as far as wanting stuff, wanting to bring this stuff back. Now as you get older, you know, you would rather keep it there, you know. But then again, the next guy comes along and ends up selling it. So at least I've got it in kind of a museum setting. But it was, I traded. I, I might have even given him food or salt or something like that or something he wanted. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Wayne, that was awesome, man. That was an unbelievable talk. You're such a stud. Um, is there any adventure left in you that anything you really want to do that you haven't done yet? God. Um, you know, uh, 
I, I don't know, that's a, that's a really good question. It kind of puts me on the spot because there's things I'd like to do, but I, um, I, sp I spoke at the Mars Society convention uh, a few months back, and I did it the year prior, a member of the Mars Society. When I, got, when I had my job at the South Pole, the winter manager at South Pole, when I was interviewed, I was asked why I wanted the job, and I told them, because I can't go to Mars. So I'd like to go to Mars, but I'm, I'm too old. Uh, you know, they're not gonna, the only way I think I could do it is if I could piss off a guy like Bezos or Musk and shoot me into Mars or something, just as a, you know. But, but I'm, I'm, right now I'm, I'm a real proponent of our space program, which I think is terribly lagging behind. Uh, so I don't know, what else? Yeah. So I'm David McAlexander, 1199. I want to ask about leeches and what technique you favor to get them off. Yeah. Do you use the salt, the uh, the cigarette? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think I think if you could get them quick enough, you could pull them off. But David's got a great point. If you don't get them off quick enough, that thing will burrow in you, and you could pull it off, and it's stuck, and it starts infecting. So the way to get leeches off is you could put salt on them. They don't like it. The other thing is to take a cigarette and burn it. I think I probably used a match. I had matches that were these lifeboat matches. You burn one of those, touch it, it just falls off. Leeches are pretty disgusting things. Yes. I was wondering if you brought anything with you specifically for trading mm. with the uh, villagers. Interestingly enough, on these trips, this is what I learned. And but these people weren't quite as bushy as what I'd find in Indonesia. In Indonesia, I did. In the Indonesian side, I brought mirrors. I brought salt. I brought, I brought um, knives, cheap knives and things and stuff like that that I could trade. So I did later on. It was something I learned to do. Yeah. A uh, bit of a mundane detail. How did you deal with the water situation? Oh boy, no, that's an important, it's probably the most important question you could ask because it scared me the first time because I knew what happened to those Australians and those Japanese. And if you drink bad water, you're, you're, you're done. It's done, it's over. You get dysentery in a place like that, you're gonna shit your guts out, you're gonna die. And there's, I'm out there alone. So I was absolutely, I was absolutely, I was very, very concerned about it. So I used tablets. I used tablets and I learned, and I couldn't see it on the slide, my vision isn't as high, but there was a picture. The one thing I learned about drinking water is if you get near a village, what you'll find is there's a place where they get their water and they'll put like a bamboo reed or pole or something like that and the water goes through it and that's where they get it. And that's, it's maybe coming down from rocks or something like that. So it'll be naturally cleaner than the stuff such stuff in a pool that they pissed in downstream or something like that, which, you know, can happen. Um, uh, but, uh, so it would be first find a spot that is the best water you can possibly get and then use like chlorine type tablets because uh, it, it, it was really important. Yeah. Did you ever get sick and if so, uh, how did you treat yourself on the trips? You know, I, I think to this trip, I, 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 yeah, there was something, I, it was interesting. I, I didn't remember this. I read, uh, I read a segment of when I was in a real bad part of the far Inga province getting out of there, and I, I wrote that I was pretty beat up, that I was, um, I had done, hurt my knee, I had leech bites, I had, I had fleas, I had something else, and I was peeing blood. And then I said, but other than that, I felt pretty good. <laughs> so, so, yes, youth. <laughs> but, but I was okay, you know, and, and okay. And um, uh, you just push on. Wayne, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Yeah. I have a question for you. A mentor of mine in my early 20s looked at me and said, the good Lord doesn't give you youth and wisdom at the same time. <laughs> and then he winked and said, you should enjoy each while they have them, while you have them. Was there, looking back on your life, was there any part of this trip that you looked at and said, well, that was really stupid. I shouldn't have done that. I, I, that, that could have done me in. Looking back at it with the wisdom you have now? You know, I was always, I approach things very cautiously. I have never been a daredevil. I'm not the guy that, you know, uh, you know, did the crazy stuff as a kid. I was always careful. But I mean, I did things that probably people might think are somewhat um, unusual, but I, I researched and did and, and tried to take as many hazards away as I could. And when I look back, I did make some mistakes. Like, I learned later some more about the people and how to deal with the people better. I learned, I was a little harsh. Um, when we were out, you know, on patrol doing our, doing the walking and the guy died, thought he was dead. I read in the diary about pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and I wouldn't have done that later. Um, you could get in a real bad situation, plus you don't want to kill somebody for God's sakes. But, you know, um, I didn't make any terrific, I made mistakes, things like I had the wrong boots. 
uh, the, for my first trip. And my feet, I, I used to have a slide, I guess I took it out, but my feet were in horrible shape afterwards. I had this jungle rot that lasted for, it came back. It was like, I, my feet hurt for like years. And um, the, the foot stuff I learned about, but, but I, I, I was careful. I, I can't think of something right off where I made just a stupid mistake and, and I could have been killed because I'm a I'm fairly cautious individual whenever I, even though I might be pushing shit, you know, I look at I, when I wrote some of the things about on the side of these cliffs and on some of the stuff that I was doing, I was in a place no one ever would have known where I was. In fact, there was a place I was at that I walk into this village and there was this little village when I was heading out into nowhere and there was this little post office thing. It was just a box, kind of a little box. And I wrote to my wife at the time, this is where I am. This is the last known position. You're going to know where I was. And I, had, I wrote, and I didn't realize it. I had 20 people sitting around watching me write this thing. And I'm like, God, it's hard to write because they're all staring at everything I do as I'm writing. I do it. I do it. I think I gave them some money so they take the key in, whatever. They take it into Hagen next time. And they, that thing never got to my wife. She never got it. I'm sure as, as I was five minutes down the trail, it was open and they had it upside down trying to read it or whatever. So, so I, if I could come up with something, i tell you what. I mean, I, I did meet some people over there. The that uh, there, were, there was a, a couple that tried to hike the Kokoda track and a guy told me they were carrying suitcases. It was a man and wife and they had suitcases. Well, that lasted about 100 yards, fortunately, and saved them from a death. And I met other people. I met some Germans in, in, in uh, the Erie and Jaya site that I couldn't believe in 1987, I think it was, that, that they totally missed the culture. They could have got us killed several times. It was the funniest thing ever, some of the stuff that happened. But, um, but I saw it. I saw what was happening. You got to understand those people, and that takes some doing. So I'm sure I did all kinds of things. I'll never know if I screwed up. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up. Um, thank you all for watching and listening and your questions. Wayne, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Stand here one second. All right. All right, you know the deal, Wayne.